so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start uh, by telling actually a couple of stories related to uh, my, my love of anger. So um, people ask me often, where did this happen? Why? Why would you spend so much of your life uh, studying anger? And the answer is, you know, I've actually been studying it a lot longer than most people think because um, so I was raised, uh, and this isn't, it's going to be, it's going to sound sad when I tell you this. It's not sad. It's, it's actually kind of funny in some ways. I was raised in a relatively angry household. It was kind of the way people tended to express themselves, especially my, my father. And so um, I would oftentimes, as a kid, you know, when you, when you live in an angry house, you spend a lot of time looking around and thinking, are they, are they mad? Are they mad at me? Why are they mad? And ultimately, those are all the same questions that I ask now as a researcher. I look around the world and I say, is this person mad? Why are they mad? Sometimes are they mad at me? I said that more as a therapist than I do uh, as, a, as a researcher. Um, and so ultimately, that's why I became interested in this. And that's how I got started in this. Um, the second thing I want to do is, is take a moment to explain my title. Because I, when I, I used to, anybody know what this is from? Can anybody name this, this line? Okay, so um, it's actually from a, a really famous movie, so famous that I listened to a podcast about it on the way here tonight. Um, it, yes, so it is, uh, it is the movie Network, um, and it's a very, very famous line from this uh, movie that uh, is actually in the AFI Top 100 list, incredible performances across the board. Um, and it, it's this line, all I know is, first you've got to get mad. He goes on to say, and you're gonna remember this one, I, I think, Go out to the window, open it, stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore, right? Which is, I think, the more famous line. The reason I bring this up is because when I first started studying anger and I would talk to people, um, people would actually, now this is a while ago, people would ask me two things. One, that they would say, oh, and they'd play a quote. So this is when I like talk to like an interview or something, and they'd, they'd play a quote from this movie, or they would say, um, uh, you won't like me when I'm angry, right? So the, the famous line of the Hulk, or I guess Bruce Banner. Um, and the thing is, um, I, this one plays a lot closer to my heart than the you won't like me when I'm angry, because the truth is, I do like you when you're angry, um, as long as you're expressing that anger in the best possible way and in healthy ways uh, and so on. So today what I want to do is talk a little bit about what that looks like and how we do that. So um, I always like to start with this, this discussion of how anger works, and because, especially because most people think it works like this, right? I'm provoked. I get mad when I'm provoked. Um, there is going to be a brief moment of audience participation. Somebody give me an example of a thing that makes them mad. Taxes. Taxes. What? The traffic, yeah. Being interrupted in conversation. Spilled milk, being interrupted. Very good. All things that make us mad. Um, I get uh, I get angry, but traffic is a biggie for me. Actually, bigger than traffic is when I am uh, walking down the hallway at work and people are walking very slowly in front of me. That is a biggie for me. And it really kind of plays into these these types of provocations that we see, um, like having our goals blocked, things like traffic. Um, things like people walking slowly in front of us, right? We have goals, something interferes in those goals. Unfair treatment, um, and it's hard. Anger arises because there's been this injustice, this thing that has interfered in our life and, and, uh, and, and or, or, or that we see um, being unjust or unreasonable. Powerlessness, people get especially angry when they feel powerless to do anything about whatever this, this goal blocking is or this unfair treatment. It's also worth noting that sometimes anger isn't the primary emotion. Sometimes people feel sad first, uh, they feel scared first, and then the anger emerges sort of secondary to that. So we experience these types of provocations, we take them in through our senses, um, and, uh, and usually sight, but hearing and, and things like that. And um, this little structure deep in our brain, it sends out signals, says, you know, our heart rate should increase, says uh, we should start breathing harder, um, our muscles tense up, our digestive system slows down, which you don't usually notice that last part, except that that's why your mouth goes dry, right? Um, is that your uh, heart rate has, uh, or excuse me, your digestive system has slowed down or stopped. And that's all to conserve energy or to direct that energy in the right place. 
All right, so the angry face. Now, here's the thing. First thing I'm going to do, another moment of audience participation. This is my favorite part. Make an angry face for me. Let me see it. Nice. Oh, you're laughing. That's not. <laughs> All right, very good. I like it. This is good. Sometimes I wonder if this is what it's like to be the. I guess. I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, um, the thing is, here's what's sort of wild about this is that you can look at that emoji and you know it's an angry face. Nobody had to teach you that, right? Why? What about it stands out? There's the color, the fact that it's red, and by the way, I want the record to show I too am wearing a shirt that is relevant to my talk, right? The red, the red shirt. Um, so there is, there is uh, the, the fact that it's red and people do associate red with anger. There's the furrowed brow. Um, there's the sort of pursed lips. And this is relatively consistent with a lot of different angry faces that we see across the board. And here's the thing, to, to acknowledge part of what you see here is marked consistency from a variety of other types of angry faces, <laughs> including the infamous grumpy cat. Um, and that actually speaks to, because part of what happens is when that little structure in our brain lights up and sends these messages out, it actually sends a message to our face or a facial motor nuclei, this little structure in, our, in the front prefrontal cortex of our brain that says, hey, you, you're mad. Let the world know you're mad. And we make a face. Um, and we make a face consistent with that. And it's, it's what we oftentimes refer to as a threat gesture. It's a way of communicating to the world that they should be careful to approach us because we're upset, because we're angry. Or let them know how to approach us. OK, so this is how people think it works. We've got a provocation, and then we've got a feeling of anger. But there's actually a step in the middle that is important, uh, and that step is appraisal. It's how we actually interpret that provocation. And it matters just as much, maybe more, than the provocation itself. Because what we see is that there's different types of thoughts that people have when they experience that provocation that might lead to anger, right? So the first thing they do is say, is this good or bad? This happens really fast. Uh, is this pleasant or unpleasant? A variation on that. Is this blameworthy? Is there a person who's at fault for this? Is it punishable? Can I do something about it? Can I get back at them? Can I get revenge? And then, can I cope with it? How bad is this? If I'm driving along, or we'll use the hallway example, I'm walking to class, people are walking pretty slowly. If I'm uh, running a little late for class, if this all of a sudden feels like a thing, oh, great. Now, I'm going to be, now it's going to be even worse, right? I'm going to be late to class. This is going to be embarrassing. Maybe it's exam day. Students are going to get, start freaking out because I'm not there. If I decide that this is something that I can't cope with, then I'm going to get far more angry than if I'm in a situation I think, oh, that's all right. I'll be a little bit late. Or I gave, I gave myself plenty of time. I'm not going to be late at all. Now, there's a couple types of thoughts. And this is some of the, the research I actually started with when I was in graduate school. Um, there's a couple of types of thoughts that we know are especially linked to anger. One is misattributing causation. Angry people, they tend to blame the wrong people for things. Um, or they, they assign intent, right? So they say, oh, I, this happened because this person did this on purpose, right? When maybe it was an accident, but they think, no, they, this person did it on purpose. Catastrophic evaluating, that's that coping piece. They might say, oh, this is the worst thing that's ever happened, right? This is going to ruin my day, my week, my year, my life, my career, whatever. Overgeneralizing. Um, they blow things up. They say, this, this always happens to me. I hit every red light on the way to work here today, or whatever, right? So they overgeneralize. Demandingness. Angry people tend to uh, think the world should kind of revolve around them. They want more attention than they necessarily deserve. They want people uh, to, to notice them and pay attention to them. And then a biggie, inflammatory labeling, right? So they label the, the, either the provocation or they label the people who they feel provoked them in some way. So here we have uh, two profiles, right? So this is um, people who are very angry are in, uh, excuse me, in red, appropriately. Uh, people who are not, who don't have anger problems are in green. And what you see across the bottom are these different thought types, right? Misattributing causation, catastrophic, catastrophic evaluating, overgeneralizing, demandingness, inflammatory labeling. And you can see across the board, they're doing these things more, right? They're more likely to misattribute causation and so on. 
And you might be inclined to, to say, well, here's, this one's the highest, so that must be the most problematic, right? That's demanding this. You might say, oof, that's pretty rough. Um, but here's the thing that I want you to notice. Look at the gap that shows up here, right? Compare that to these. These are all kind of relatively similar, but this gap really tells you that the difference between a person who is very angry and a person who's not that angry is a tendency to label. They look at other people who provoke them in some way, or they feel provoked by, and they say, that person is an idiot, that person is a loser. And then they stop responding to them as a human being, and they start thinking of them as the label that they've given them. And once we do that, we're just much more likely to continue to be angered by them. All right, there's actually one other step. I'm going to talk about it um, uh, real quickly, and that is that it's not just the provocation that matters. It's also our pre-anger state. So what we were doing and feeling at the moment of that provocation. So when we're really tired, when we're hungry, uh, when we are stressed about something. I tell you, I'm actually a relative, this is going to be surprising to some people who know me, but I'm a relatively chill driver. I don't get too angry when I'm, when I'm behind the wheel of a car. I just sort of feel like, no, I'll get there, everything's going to be fine. If I'm ever running low on gas, I really start to lose it, right? Because all of a sudden, my pre-anger states change a little bit. I start to think, oh, this is going to be terrible, right? I'm going to, I'm going to run out of gas, and now I'm going to find myself like having to walk uh, where I go. Maybe I've got the kids in the car. This is the worst thing ever. How could I do this? What is the matter with me, right? So I've got all these that, that essentially this, and some of that's the provocation, but some of it's this situation changes me and my attitude about things increases stress and, and exacerbates that appraisal, that negative appraisal process. But here's the other thing. Part of what happens when we are tired and when we are hungry, when we are stressed, is we have this structure in the front of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is actually, it, it's where a lot of decision making happens. It's, it's impulse control. This is what stops us from doing what we want to do because fundamentally, Anger is an emotion associated with the desire to lash out, right? And what stops us from lashing out is our capacity for impulse control. When I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I'm stressed, all those things, we see that this part of the brain, this prefrontal cortex, is a little less active, and we're more likely to act on those impulses. So I bring all this up because when we are angry, there's actually infinite things that's separate from those expressions of anger. We can do lots of things when we're angry. In fact, there are infinite ways that we can express our anger. We can express it outwardly, which is what people typically think of. We can yell and swear and hit and scream, and we can vent online and things like that. Uh, sometimes we express it inwardly. We can pout, we can cry, we can ruminate. Uh, we think about it all day long. We can avoid those things. Those are all things we can do when we're angry. We can actually, though, express things in a more adaptive way. We can problem solve. You know, fundamentally, anger is telling you that you have a problem, that you've experienced some sort of problem, and, right? and we can try and solve that problem. We can meditate, we can exercise, we can protest, we can assert ourselves in a polite way, we can journal, we can create art, write poetry, uh, we can write letters to the editor. There's all sorts of these adaptive things. And, one of the things I always want people to understand is that anger is, part of its goal is that it's your body's way or your brain's way of alerting you to this injustice. And then the reason why your heart rate increases, the reason why uh, your blood starts to boil a little bit, is because it's your body's way of energizing you to confront that injustice. And there are infinite ways that we can confront that injustice. So, people often say to me, so what's the best thing? to do when you get angry. The truth is, and I'm sorry this isn't bigger, but I think I go back to this model. I say I want, you should consider how your anger works, how you tend to respond, the types of thoughts you have, the types of situations that lead to anger. And you can do things to, to address that. You can avoid unnecessary triggers. You can get healthy sleep, right? That's gonna influence that pre-anger state. You can think about your thoughts. You can think about the types of thoughts you tend to have in those situations. You can relax, right? That'll help deal with the feeling of anger, sort of deep breath, uh, yoga, whatever, meditation, visualization. And then you can think about what you do with it once you're there. 
that is I have one minute left. I promised I wouldn't go late, so what should I do for this last minute? Any suggestions? <laughs> Sounds like we can uh, go into the questions. <laughs> Kelly. Are there periods of history that are considered more angry than others, and are we in a moment that is more angry? <laughs> <laughs> I, so I wish I had a, a concrete answer to that question. And I say that partially because I want to know, but also because I, I'm asked that all the time. Um, and the, the thing is, um, I don't. I, the reason I don't know is because I don't know that we have any good, solid indicators of such things as far as any kind of consistent data that I can point to and say, yes, here's our data that says we are. I can say that I, th I think we are uh, in an angrier moment right now. Um, and I think that some of that is actually driven by things we have created that um, and, and by that I mean, I think technology tends to, exa uh, the, the way we use technology, I should say, and social media tends to exacerbate anger. Um, I think it changes the way we appraise things. I think it changes how much we have to respond to. I, I've used this example before. In the mornings when I get up and, and make my coffee, you know, I, I used to, I don't know what I did actually, before I had a phone to look at, I had no idea what I did while I was waiting for my coffee to, to brew. Now I know what I do, it's scroll through, you know, a bunch of posts from people, and that is, um, that is uh, an opportunity to feel things, good and bad and sometimes angering, that I just didn't used to have. And so I think that some of those things exacerbate uh, the, the way we feel. I also think we have, um, I think we have some modeling of anger, of discourse that exaggerates or, or makes it seem like it's okay to yell and scream and, and things like that, and that is exacerbating. So I think a lot of that does seem like it's making things uh, like we like times are angrier. I, I would also add things like population density and things like that. We have a lot more of that than we once did, and all of that tends to influence things in a in a negative way. And it also occurs to me that with a huge surge in people uh, pursuing things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, all of those things that are constructive responses to that appraisal, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're spending way more dollars and time pursuing right. things like that is yeah, no, you're right. I, I could see that being an indicator. Unfortunately, part of the problem is that sometimes those things that I, I think would be good indicators are also good indicators of other things, right? So that'd be, that'd be a good indicator of anger, but maybe also of stress um, and, and other sorts of like related but different phenomena. But I agree. Yeah. Okay. My question is about self-awareness and awareness of others. Mm -hmm. Because they were anger. Because, so you listed all of these super healthy ways that people can express anger. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, the ratio, like, the more angry you get, the less impulse control you have, and then yes. it becomes so much harder yep. to express your anger in, in healthy ways, and that's when you get labeling. And, um, so, what, if, if you were to offer advice to somebody who is maybe not great at self-awareness, or uh, maybe doesn't have the greatest impulse control. I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would you say to them? Yeah, so one of the things, there's really two things I would point to. One is, um, sometimes it's helpful to practice and evaluate those situations when you're not angry. And so to think back at times you've gotten mad and reflect on, how you reacted, what you may have done wrong, what you may have done right, what you wish you would have done, and, and so on. Um, and I, I want to be careful of those labels, actually, because I, I think wrong and right uh, suggest that there's always a best way to act, and I don't necessarily believe that. Um, but I think reflecting on that when you're not angry is important. Um, and then just continuing to practice. and. Um, because I think that's where the insight comes from. You know, it, it takes us a lifetime to develop the habits that we've developed when it comes to how we express our emotions. And undoing that isn't something that can just happen, especially when we're talking about something like anger, because if for the exact point you made, when you're angry, you do, one of the downsides is you do get kind of locked into a way of thinking and it's harder to express. Okay. 
take one more? Yes. Right. Let's go over there. Uh, I, I don't know. From the Sorry. standpoint of uh, evolutionary biology, I guess, do people bring into your class the notion that uh, the way you generations live to reproduce is by cultivating, uh, skipping the appraisal step and going right <laughs> to action? So it's a great, great question. People do bring it to my class. Usually it's me. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we acknowledge that one of the things that we see is that what happens when people are angry is, is and, and it's rooted in our evolutionary history, all of this is, is that we believe that we're absolutely right to be angry and therefore we're right to attack. And so in, in many ways, skipping that process of actually thinking through the, you know, what we're feeling. Yeah. Have you looked into drug use and anger? Um, yes, there's actually, and there's two ways of thinking about that. Um, and one is, uh, so drug use is a common consequence of anger, but we actually see it in two ways. One is that we see it as, uh, used as a way of dealing with anger. So people who have anger problems oftentimes use uh, substances to find, to relax or to cope um, with that. We also see that in some instances, certain drugs exacerbate uh, one's likely to be, likelihood of being aggressive, but that's better predicted by how they view aggression when they're sober. So people who are, are cool with using violence as a means of solving problems are more likely to use it when they're drunk too. That's really what it comes down to. By the way, I kid you not, and I know I've got to be done, but the author of the article on the, the, the relationship between marijuana and anger, his last name is Stoner. So, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with that. Okay, well, Casey, one more. Oh, oh, yeah, one I thought Casey was giving me the hook. I saw a young hand go up during the Q&A, so oh. I just wanted to take time. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Do you remember what it was? You can ask it. Go ahead. He no? told me what it was. Go ahead. That's okay. Does your blood actually boil when you're mad? <laughs> oh, that, I love that question so, so much. It, it does not actually boil, but our temperature, body temperature, does start to increase as our blood pumps through our body, which is where that comes from. That is a wonderful question. Thank you very much for asking it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan.